The 6.5 is on the road with a view from Davos. We are having some incredible conversations here about tech, about finance, maybe a little politics put uh, in here, but let's put politics aside for a second. I want to introduce Dr. Myers. Dr. Myers, great to see you. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's been fun. So, um, what are you, we're, you, we're all here at Davos. What are you trying to get out of this conference? What are the things that you're going to be looking for? Well, I always learn a lot. Uh, a lot of creative people, uh, brilliant people here. Uh, and so I always come back with the new ideas and connections and, of course, business. The connections lead to business for AccuWeather, and uh, ultimately it's a business trip. I love it. Same here. This is a business trip yeah. for us as well. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an interesting time, though. Uh, we're in the middle of a pretty significant day today, the inauguration of the new president of the United States. I know you've been in this business, I think, what, over 60 years now, so lots of change going on here in Davos. You know, there's always a bit of impact on how, uh, not just impact on the weather, impact on climate, but there's impact with different administrations on how this is all being sort of sought and seen. Just kind of interested, any thoughts on this big day, uh, national championship football game, inauguration day, and of course, first day of Davos, uh, about kind of how things are going to play out over the next few years? Well, clearly there are going to be changes, uh, you know, different view of uh, climate and business, and uh, uh, hopefully it'll be positive. And, uh, uh, but you'll have to wait and see the changes. I, I think one thing we're going to see is greater government efficiency, uh, and, uh, but a big change obviously coming. But in, in terms of your world, in ter let's, let's zero in a bit on climate and weather. Um, we know this event has historically been very climate centric, but uh, it's a little different now. It's been very AI centric and AI is almost diametrically opposed to some of the sustainability conversations we've had. We know as tech analysts, the amount of energy and power that's going to be required. I think they're probably going to be talking about, you know, everything from fusion to, you know, how we can grow a nuclear power because we certainly can't keep doing it the way we're doing it today. Do you have any thoughts kind of on that sort of conflict? Because uh, I know you're big on AI. You've been doing machine learning for decades now. Like we're in a pretty big inflection. Yeah, well, humanity's at a big inflection because of AI and because of the acceleration of technology, as we all know, and uh, that acceleration is accelerating. <laughs> and so uh, we have less ability to predict the future, except for AccuWeather forecasts, of course, <laughs> uh, than ever before. And you're right, I haven't heard many people talk about it as a conflict, but I guess it is because AI is going to demand more and more energy, and I think a lot of the forecasts that we're reading of how much energy we'll need over the next 10, 12 years are too low. Uh, I could see the demand for energy doubling over the next 12 years, and clearly where's that power going to come from? And uh, most of it's going to come from the traditional sources, oil and gas and even coal, uh, even as rapidly as the alternatives are accelerating. And the only answer ultimately for humanity is fusion, because fusion produces no greenhouse gases and uh, will be a real breakthrough. But how far off it is, and is it going to be available on a huge scale, that <laughs> remains to be seen. But AI may help us solve that problem. Yeah, so Dr. Myers, uh, first of all, congratulations on your 63-year-old startup. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and that's what it is. That's how we call it, and that's how we act at AccuWeather always focused on creativity, innovation, and, and moving the boundaries forward. So you've been doing this for 63 years. Yeah. Um, I haven't. Uh, I think I'm just a mere 35 years in the game here. But um, I, I, I look at weather and analysis as one of the first big data exercises. And I'm curious, we see all these generative AI startups, but it, it's all about data. Is there any words of inspiration, words of wisdom that you can give uh, the generative AI startups today that you've learned in your 63 years at AccuWeather? Well, the data is important. And obviously, that's one thing at AccuWeather we focus on. Uh, the data has to be the best, the cleanest, the most reliable, uh, greatest depth, uh, more uh, time, you know, minute by minute, hour by hour, uh, more points on the planet than any other, anybody else, 300 parameters. So it's the depth and breadth and the cleanliness of the data, the old saying, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, we get better results for the companies we work with. We work for thousands of businesses around the world to develop and train algorithms that are going to be allow better prediction of whatever the weather 
correlates to, and uh, it correlates to a lot of things. Does generative AI, does it help anything in your universe of weather? Yeah, we used AI before people called it that. Sure. Uh, uh, because, but it's not just the computer, but it, we found the best, the most accurate forecasts are a combination of uh, the computer outputs and taking the best of all the computer models, and we have 192 forecast models that cover the globe that we bring in from all Canadian Weather Service, Europe, the US, and, and private sources. But it's taken the best of those in an AI way, but then also using our meteorologists, over 100 forecast meteorologists, and their experience, I mean, hurricane experts and tornado experts that can beat any model. And given the best model combination, and then the hum humans who are experts produces the best and most accurate forecast. But, and part of that is communications. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, a forecast is only as good as the decision people make based on it sure. and so a lot of the output on things don't take that into account you can issue a warning that causes people to say oh i've lived through that before or a warning that causes them to say i better get the hell out of my house because it's going to burn down and that's the key in the end to any kind of a forecast yeah well speaking of of burning down you know we've had some pretty chaotic weather climate um, of course, there's always a continuum of people's assessment of what's happening, but just, for instance, L.A., uh, you know, we've seen a just unprecedented set of wildfires. Any sort of kind of thoughts on the impact of climate and, you know, what are some of the things that with weather that someone like yourself with all this data, all this experience is sort of suggesting and recommending? I'm sure you talk to leaders and, you know, I'm sure you talk to, you know, Politi politicians and different advocacy groups like kind of what are you recommending to try to you know avoid this or at least be more prepared for situations like this so they don't keep happening well last year at davos i launched my book invisible iceberg how weather and climate shaped history and of course the weather and climate have shaped history and have impacted humanity from the beginning from the going way back what things got set up for humanity by the comet that hit the earth and destroyed the dinosaurs so uh, and we were in an ice age just 12,000 years ago where the ice was two and a half miles thick over Montreal, Canada, and the ocean levels were 450 feet lower than they are today, just 12,000 years ago. So the earth has been warming since then. It was a little ice age up to 1850. So naturally, uh, the earth has been warming coming out of that ice age anyway, but humans are certainly contributing to that warming and impacting the climate. And there are more and more of these disastrous effects and we're going to have to continue to deal with those. And in some parts, uh, the statistics that we use, talking about the database that we talked about earlier that AccuWeather has suggests that the warming is going to, in some places, is happening faster than the climate models suggest. So everybody's using the same climate models and can make general forecasts. But our statistical analysis show that the warming in some places is, is happening faster than those models suggest. And you have to keep that in mind too. Some parts of the world are warming very slowly, other parts much more rapidly. So uh, the individual forecasts long-term have to take that into account. Now, getting to California, uh, the things humans did or didn't do on top of the climate change that uh, caused this fire, it sort of shocks me that, uh, you know, we depend on the government for so many things supposedly, that they were not better prepared to deal with the fires. I mean, a few small planes flying overhead, dropping water. I mean, it was like a war against right. the environment. Uh, uh, that's a political comment, I guess, and maybe I don't know enough, but it just seemed to me, knowing how, I mean, now we estimated the total damage and economic loss, not only from the fires, but long-term from jobs lost, businesses gone, and all the effect that governments are gonna to have to spend and the health effects over years from the bad air, 250 to 275 billion dollars. That was AccuWeather's estimate. It's got a lot of press, as you know. That's 1% of the GDP. And on top of the hurricane effects this year, we're talking about 2% or more of the GDP lost due to environmental disasters. I was gonna say, Dr. Myers, um, so I think I mean, I, I believe that uh, the reaction to these fires are, is one of the worst government reactions we've seen in a while. I'm curious, and, and we talked about there was garbage in, garbage out. 
there's really good data with a garbage response. And I'm curious, what, are, what is one of the best responses that you've seen due to weather where your data came in, gave an indication of something, and then people made changes because of it? Well, the companies we work for, uh, uh, now with Hurricane Milton that hit Western North Carolina, uh, we said five and a half days in advance for extreme northern Georgia, western North Carolina, extreme eastern Tennessee, it, there would be catastrophic flooding, evacuate. You can't be any more dramatic than that. Right. Five and a half days in advance, constantly saying that. So some people left because of that and right. saved their lives, and other people, unfortunately, didn't. But uh, Hurricane Sandy that hit uh, New Jersey, the we, company we work for, <clears throat> we work for a lot of businesses, uh, told them eight days ahead, they told us that forecast, that one forecast was worth $65 million to them. They had water and batteries and all the things people need in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland. Before the hurricane hit, their competitors were out. And so this is the kind of help that we provide to businesses and to the public uh, through our superior forecast. And that's why we say AccuWeather has superior accuracy and it's been proven. Yeah. Well, Dr. Mars, maybe a final question. You know, we did a uh, really significant research study that's actually going to be released here in Davos with uh, with Carney, and the the focus of the study was really about CEOs and how they're thinking about AI, implementing it, managing it, governing it. And one of the really interesting findings was that companies that were succeeding. Now, again, it's still early with AI, and we could laugh, because you've been doing it for like four decades, but like for a lot of companies and with really the disruption that's happening, it's still pretty early. But when CEOs kind of tried to hold too tight, the CEOs and the boards held too tight to AI and sort of tried to joystick it into the company, those initiatives were, str were struggling to be successful. It seemed more about you know the ability to delegate to your teams, the lines of businesses, the technologies. As someone who's you know, been doing this a long time. By the way, now you've even appointed a CEO for AccuWeather. You're, you've taken that founder chairman role. I mean, how do you, what do you sort of think about that? And how would you suggest to companies like yours, 60 year old startups and new companies, that they can really get the most out of their, their AI projects and be successful? Well, uh, as you said, we've used AI for a long time and, and I did appoint somebody CEO, Steve Smith, uh, almost two years ago, and I joke that uh, that allowed me to cut back from 70 hours a week to 62. Uh, so, but I'm having a lot of fun. I'm doing more of the things I like to, I like to do. But that study doesn't surprise me at all. You have to empower people. Uh, but I, I did appoint a couple of people to be sort of the leaders and the advocates across the company. But we brought a consultant in and trained everybody in AI and gave them the tools and encourage those who wanted to to play an active role. And five to 10 percent of people really embrace it and, and then become sort of leaders in their area. So you got to empower people, give them the tools and let them go. But we've always been, you know, our motto is ICE, innovation, creativity and entrepreneurship. And that's how AccuWeather operates. So, sounds like every technological revolution ever is AI is just faster and is a bit more, right. you know, it's yes. a bit more in our face right now, but it's the right. same challenges about empowering your organization. It was a Steve Jobs, you don't hire smart people and tell them what to do thing. It sounds like there's a lot of that here. Dr. Myers, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with us. Sure, Great pleasure. conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Congratulations on thank all you. the success. Thank you. And we'll uh, hopefully catch up with you again soon. I look forward to it. And thank you everybody for joining us for this episode of 6-5 on the Road, A View from Davos. For Patrick Moorhead and myself, it's time to say goodbye. Stick with us for all of our coverage here at the World Economic Forum 2025. We'll see you all later.